Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live, a prophetic segment. And I want to make sure that that is clear for those that will be watching this particular broadcast. It'll also be featured on Danun Institute of Biblical Research as well. Uh, because although we have already reported this on our news segment, I want to make sure that we publish it in both places because it is definitely breaking news. And uh, it is prophetic news. Uh, in the very highest regard. The name of the, the video here is called The Two Witnesses Have Arrived. Now, I don't mean that as far as a literal sense, so bear with me as I go through this. We're going to go back into the news that we did just the other day that Haaretz, the newspaper, uh, online newspaper publication, as well as a printed publication in Israel there, have reported about uh, Israel uh, putting together a committee to consider bringing in uh, the Jewish people that are not actually practicing Jews from different parts of the world. This, in essence, brings home the lost tribes of Israel, the house of Israel, in doing so. So, uh, without further ado, let me go uh, right to that article there. We are going to cover a number of issues here. It is a lengthy news broadcast, uh, a prophetic segment, again, as I say. For those of you that just come for news alone, uh, you might want to just skip this broadcast if you're not into these things here. So, uh, but anyway, I'd encourage you to stay regardless, nonetheless. Uh, the the head of the, the title of the article here on Haaretz, which was on August the 17th, just a couple of days ago, is the New Diaspora Ministries an, uh, Initiative could open Israel's gates to millions of non-Jews with Jewish links. Uh, new advisory committee set up to explore pol a policy change without any representatives of relevant ministries or organizations. Kind of glad to hear that. That way it keeps uh, the... Uh keeps it to, 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 to give them the ability to work. I'm just going to read you a little portion of the article, then we're going to go right into the prophetic side of this and encourage uh, the different people, the members of this committee, to keep in mind of the biblical mandate that God has set down for Israel. This is something that must be approved. Uh, I'll be speaking in Jerusalem, by the way, and that's coming up... Uh, uh, in September, on September 16th. Uh, again, I encourage those of you that uh, ReconciliationWithIsrael.com, please support this work. It is very expensive uh, for Brother Kellen and his wife to put this uh, meeting together. And you can go to their website, ReconciliationWithIsrael.com there, and show your support uh, financially, mainly because they need the finances to finish paying for the venue where the meeting is being uh, held at. Uh, we will be speaking there, me and my wife, along with many other uh, uh, people. Uh, uh, Avi Lipkin will be speaking directly after I do. Uh, there's two Orthodox Jews that speak before me, and, uh, and of course many other speakers on the days before and even after. So I encourage you to, to be a part of this, support this. Uh, they do need your help in making this happen. Okay, right to the article here, indicating a possible shift of government policy toward emerging Jewish communities around the world. Israel's Ministry of the Diaspora has created a new committee to present recommendations of what it defines as groups with ties to the Jewish people. Member of these emerging Jewish communities are not allowed to immigrate to Israel today under the law of return which provides citizenship only to individuals who have at least one Jewish grandparent or Jewish spouse or have converted to Judaism. Uh, emerging Jewish communities cover a wide spectrum. They include groups that claim descendant from the so-called lost tribes, such as the B'nai Manasseh uh, from northeastern India. This is the one Michael Froon on IsraelReturns.org, his website, same as ours, just different, uh, ending.org, word.com. Uh, that was able to bring them back to Israel. And God bless him for his tremendous work in doing so. I know uh, Brother Kellen Davison uh, also interviewed him for their magazine as well. Very interesting uh, article there. Anyway, it goes on to say that emerging Jewish communities over a worldwide spectrum, they include groups that claim descendant from the so-called lost tribes, such as the B'nai Manasseh from uh, northeastern India. They also include B'nai uh, Anosim, descendants of the Jews forced to con uh, convert during the Spanish-Portuguese Inquisition. Uh, which happens to be my own father's family. We were actually Moroccan Jews. Uh, we migrated to France, where, in fact, one of my uh, cousins there was the chief rabbi of Paris uh, at one time. Uh, his name is Denoun, D-E-N-O-U-N. Uh, my father used D-E-N-O-O-N, 
And, uh, and of course, we had restored back the original name, which the Danun family believes to be Binun, the descendants of Joshua. Uh, anyway, so uh, it says here that uh, to convert the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition edition, they include numerous communities in South America and other remote corners of the world that have recently d discovered Judaism and embraced Jewish practices, sometimes converting to Judaism, but often not. It's important you saw that scholars who study emerging Jewish communities, also known as Judaizing communities, have estimated their numbers in the millions. Now, let's get right into this. And uh, I, I want to look at this from the biblical aspect as well as other prophecies that are fulfilling in Israel. Uh, and this is why we're saying the two witnesses have arrived. Now, when I say this, you must understand that in order for uh, these prophecies to be fulfilling themselves, your two witnesses have to be on the scene. Now, it doesn't mean that they have to be in Israel at the very moment, because according to Isaiah 61, it would be strangers shall be your plowmen. That is a redemption of Israel. That is a prophecy speaking about Israel. So the sons of the alien, Isaiah 61 brings out showing that they will not be a part of the Israeli community as of today, but will definitely come to Israel. Now, I happen to believe that the two witnesses are also going to get the bride ready because clearly the church ministers around the world have failed to get a bride ready for Yeshua. And uh, this is clearly being seen in the, in, the, in, the, in the recent things. You know, the Bible says, search for me as a hidden treasure. And in some of the non-canon documents there that we have found on Yeshua, uh, he talks about it being hidden in the earth even. And that is what we're finding in some of these documents that are being discovered in and around the world, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I encourage rabbis from around the world that you bring the Vatican forward and make them accountable to give you all the documents that they are not releasing to you. They're not releasing to you that this uh, it was in fact an Essene community and they did have the documents of Yeshua there as well but the Vatican will not release it because it totally nullifies the Vatican's legitimacy as the Church of God because they're not. They are a Mithras religion. It is not Christian in nature whatsoever. Only mixed a little Christianity with a, a whole lot of paganism and now trying to get you to believe such of a lie. Now before I really get into this, let me just state something here. I think it's important for you to know this. I had someone recently say to me, they said, Steve, you're doing just like Pope Francis. Uh, he's also saying, uh, believing that uh, we shouldn't kill animals and that uh, this is the same agenda he has. Well, perhaps many of you are not considering the fact that the word Antichrist, Antichristo from the Greek, is a substitute or in place of Yeshua. It is someone that is like Christ, someone that mirrors the image of what he was. All right, now, what we see in the Gospels that we have, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, they have hidden from you many of the truths that Yeshua did say. Those are true documents that we have, with the exception that they added in the multiplying of the fish. That was not part of the original canon. That was added. Isn't it interesting when you, later in the Gospels that we have, there, Yeshua recounts the multiplying of bread. Why doesn't he mention the fish? Well, they forgot to add that in, you see, because in the early manuscripts, and some of the early Greek manuscripts, Multiplying fish is not there. And by the way, I did confirm for you, the, uh, in London, England, where the oldest, in the British Museum there, the oldest uh, Greek manuscript that they have of the Bible, it is 14,000 plus differences from the Bible that you're reading today, and even from the other manuscripts that have been altered and changed down through the years. 14,000. And some of those that say, oh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are so much like our Bible, that is totally nonsense. Yes, there is a lot of similarities. Just like in the book Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, there's a lot of similarities to that of the Essene Gospel. In fact, we're taking the Essene Humane Gospel and we're doing a scholastic research and we're putting in, we've actually already placed it into Bible format for you, chapters, verses, and we're putting in all of the, uh, of the research references, not only from the New Testaments, where it's quoted just like it is in the New Testament from those documents there, but also where he quotes the prophets historically as well as the book of Adam and Eve, the book of Enoch, which he quotes. The Bible we have today quotes the book of Enoch many, many times. Why do they say it's not part of the canon? Why would anybody even challenge me to say, why would you quote from the book of Enoch? It's not part of the canon. Well, the Bible quotes from the book of Enoch multiple, multiple times. Okay, so 
we're doing our own research for you because we want to put this in your hands to see that these documents are really so he said search for it like a hidden treasure all right so anyway uh, going back to this part about Pope Francis, see, they say, well, he's also for not eating meat, not killing the animals, and recently even published that animals go to heaven. Well, he happens to be right on these things. You know, you got to remember, he is like Christ. He's like the Christ that is in the Essene Gospel, in fact, a humanitarian uh, 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 makeshift Yeshua. But believe me, he is an antichrist. He's even for, if you'll notice, what did Jesus say to the rich young ruler? He said, you lack one thing. Sell what you have and give to the poor. See? Now, in other words, even in the Essene community, they had things in common with one another. One was not some great multimillionaire and the rest were all poor. He wanted them to share. Well, Pope Francis does the same, does he not? <clears throat> now, but that's written in your own canon. So, do, if I, uh, I agree. I think that we should. If you've got a brother in need, help that brother out if you've got the means to do so. You see? Now, but do you think Pope Francis is going to sell off all the gold of the Vatican and give it to the poor? No. He's only a, uh, a sheep, uh, excuse me, a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's coming to be like Christ in appearance, but not truly the Messiah. You see? So therefore, he's not going to sell off his millions and give, and yet, you know, and, and I can't, I'm, I'm not, I won't get in because Jesus said keep things privately and everything, but that, thus we try to honor what he said. We try to give to the people. This is our, this is our mission. And we look for the poorest of poor to do it with. All right. Now, uh, let me say this too, though. When you come, when people come to me and say, well, Steve, you're doing just like the Pope and everything you stand for. It. Let me tell you something. The Pope also is against abortion, isn't he? Okay. Does that mean we don't speak against abortion because he also speaks against abortion? Nonsense. You stand for the word of God. If he stands for part of it, well, that's good. But remember his agenda is different. He also says that you should move into the cities, move into the big cities. That's another thing Pope Francis is for. But let me tell you something. When you read the gospel that Yeshua brought out in the humane gospel there, you find out that he said, stay away from the cities. Move to the countries because there's many evils in the cities. So see, he's mixing his agenda. All right. He's going to get some of it right, but he's not going to get all of it right. All right. So anyway, I just want to clarify that issue with you there. Because one, Pope Francis is fulfilling biblical prophecy. And we're going to get into that in just a moment as well. Now, let's first take a look at the article here. Um, uh, and this is for Jewish brethren as well that may be listening. I encourage you to recognize, first off, we're going to look at the prophecy that, that is being fulfilled. Even Well, let me, no, I, I, I really need to back up to the prophecy that just got fulfilled recently. So we've got to rehash some of this before we go back to what's about to fulfill because I got to show you how the two witnesses play into this. Now, I mentioned to you not too long ago that Obadiah, the prophet Obadiah actually clearly identifies Pope Francis fulfilling prophecy. Now one, we have to understand who is Rome? Who are the Romans? Who is the Vatican in this case here? This is Esau's descendants. I've brought this out many times before. We know that one of uh, Esau's royal sons uh, survived the execution that was against him with David. He escaped to Egypt, was raised in the house of Pharaoh. That was Hadad. He goes to Syria later, becomes the king of Syria. And according to the Jews, he, they, they, they say that, uh, that he migrated to, to northern uh, uh, Egypt, or excuse me, northern Africa, into those areas there, around Libya, Egypt, those places there. And then they say that he went into Rome later. Well, Obadiah clearly puts Esau and his descendants in Rome. We find, though, this because the prophet Obadiah absolutely puts Esau there. In verse chapter 1, verse 6, he says, How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? See, what is he speaking about? He's trying to let you know that Esau is definitely in, uh, in Rome. He's letting you know where he's at. He says, All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that are, were at peace with thee, they have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They, they that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. In other words, Esau <clears throat> has no revelation. All right? Now, when he talks about the confederacy, all right, what is he speaking about? My hands are dry. I apologize about this. Just got to deal with that as well because it makes it hard to turn the pages. Psalm 83. All right, here's the confederacy right here. Keep thou not silence, O God. Hold not thy peace and be still, O God. For lo, thine enemies have make a, make a tumult, an uproar. That's an uproar. 
Uh, and that's exactly what's happening in Israel. It's a huge uproar. Why? Because the Vatican is confederate with all these Muslim nations to come against Israel. All right? Uh, it says, they, they that hate thee have lifted up the head. All right? The, they that hate thee. Who's the ones that hate him? That's the Arab people. The Arab people hate him, as well as Esau. Esau hates him as well. All right? It says, they, they have said, come, let us cut, him, cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. What does Obadiah say? He says right there, all the men of thy confederacy, see, have even brought thee to the border. They, they're the ones that got him into Israel. It was the Arabs. Remember, Daniel says in chapter... Um, I believe it's chapter 11 that he comes up, this, talking about the prince that shall come, comes up strong with a small people. He came up with the Palestinians. He worked deals with the Arabs, the Syrians, and all of these groups out there working these deals with them. And he's come up strong with them. And what's happened in all of this? See, he's, he, he became confederate with them. And it says here, the men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee, and they prevailed against thee. Now there's much talk about ISIS wanting to destroy the Vatican. See, but he's confederate with them nonetheless. Go back to Psalm. See, what does it say here? Verse 5, For they have consulted together with one consent, they are confederate against thee. Alright? Now, Verse 6, the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites and the Moab and the Hagarines and Gebal and Ammon and Amalek and the Philistines and the inhabitants of Tyre. See, he goes into all these different Arabic nations. But notice the tabernacles or the tents, is literally what it's in Hebrew, the tents of, Edom, uh, of Esau. That's the churches. Look how many churches are against Israel. Prophecy fulfilling itself. Psalm 83 is fulfilling itself even now. And they're going to make a war against Israel. They're already making a war with them, against them, in a, uh, in, 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 in a, in a political war. All right, now, let me back up, though. There's one thing that we missed here. Verse 3, where it says, um, uh, he said, uh, They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and which is Israel, and consulted against thy hidden ones. That's your two witnesses. What have they consulted about? The Vatican has already, speaking with all these Arabic nations, he's already told them, you know, there, there's coming two witnesses that John speaks about in Revelation. How are we going to deal with it? They've got to fake it. You remember there were two false witnesses. The Bible says about Yeshua, when they were bringing him up for judgment, they said that many wit false witnesses were sought after against him. They wanted somebody to come and testify against him. But at the last, they found two false witnesses. Now, I have actually said in the past, could it be Pope Francis and Pope Benedict? In one way, yes, but then there's another way. It could even still yet be two men that are loyal to the Pope of Rome that rise up with powers and miracles as false witnesses. Why do I say this? Because remember the Pharaoh of Egypt, he was not James or Jambers that withstood Moses and Aaron. But two of his magicians stood up against Moses and Aaron. And don't think that the Pope of Rome doesn't know this. He knows that the two witnesses are coming. And he knows that they're going to stand for what was hidden in the Essene Humane Gospel. He knows that they'll stand against the killing of the animals. He knows all these things. And he knows they'll have signs and wonders and miracles. Why do you think the Pope of Rome has worked together with the evangelical community to bring them to inside the Vatican to bring it with one? Because he's looking for somebody that's a miracle maker. He needs two false witnesses that'll stand for his false ideology to come against Israel and come against God's anointed. That's what's going to happen. All right? Now, so I just wanted to show you here then. Now, also in verse 12, let's drop down to verse 12 in Obadiah chapter 1, only one chapter in you. But thou shouldest not, God is going to identify who Esau is, but thou shouldest not look on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have re rejoiced over the, uh, the children of Judah in the day there of their destruction. 70 AD, he clearly identifies when this prophecy is fulfilled. Okay? Esau. Esau is there at the destruction of the... Of the uh, not only uh, the second temple, but as well as the destruction of the Jewish people, the house of Judah. My gosh, people wake up. 
<sighs> you know, it, I, I, I'll leave that alone. Anyway, verse 13, Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on the affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Is it not on the ark of Titus? All the, you know, Titus was a Roman general. He came down there. He used the Syrian army, you know. You got, you got these great biblical teachers like Chuck Missler that say, well, it wasn't really Rome that did it. You know, they're trying to get the heat off of the Pope. They're trying to get the heat off the Vatican. He says it was actually the Syrian army. Do you forget that Hadad was once the king of Syria? Do you not know that they have marital ties? Just like today they have marital ties. The very birth of Islam is from the Vatican. And you Arab people that are in the Middle East and all these countries here, you've been fooled and duped by the Pope of Rome. And Constantine, everybody talks about Constantine having a great vision and, and he saw uh, the cross and stuff like that. Eusebius writes this, right? Do you ever notice when Eusebius first writes about the victory that, that, uh, that, uh, that Constantine had at this battle when it first happened, he never mentions the vision of the cross or anything like that? It's only a few years later when he's having a big banquet and got to bring together all the Christian dignitaries together with Constantine and his Mithras priest out there, all a bunch of pagans that are worshiping at the same place or next door to each other, just like they do today. Notice everywhere you look, you see a Catholic church, you see a, 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 an Arabic mosque as well. You see them both side by side or one over the other. Wow, they're all the same religion anyway. You know, I give credit, you know, the, 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 the Christians, you know, many of them, they tried to break away and go back to what they believe to be truth. But they forget that, that, that Constantine had already uh, decided what was going to be state religion. And, and, and go, to the, go to the Ark of Constantine right there. I've been there. I've seen it myself. You know, they did a documentary on the History Channel. Do you see any crosses on, the soldier, on his soldier's shields? Do you see anything with crosses anywhere on it? I got many pictures of it. No, you don't. You see a lot of pagans on it and pagan gods on it. Constantine was never a Christian. He was a pagan. And he helped or or uh, organize the first Roman Catholic Church. Interesting. State religion. You know what happens when you have state religions, don't you? The state controls what they say. Hmm. At any rate here, going back to Obadiah here. Let's take a look at this, what it says here. Verse 16. For as you drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down and they shall be as though they had not been. That was a prophecy that was fulfilled just recently, 2014, Easter Sunday. In Hebrew it says, Ki ka ashe ashotetim, al ha kodeshi ishatu kol ha goim. See, what is that? That is, the, the, this, this masculine plural to begin with the first part of this, ka ashe ashotetim. Ashotetim is to drink, but it's men only. And, According to the Vatican's own news agency that was there that filmed it, and the man is speaking on there. I can't even publish it because they put such a strict copyright on there. But they clearly said the only ones that participated in the communion were only the Pope's delegation and those men that were there. It was men only the first time. But then it says, after that, Al Al Ha Kodeshi upon my holy mountain Ishetu, they will drink. That's now gender inclusive and a plural. See, Kol Ha Goim, all the Gentiles. You Jewish brethren, do you not get that the Pope of Rome is sitting there fulfilling prophecy out of Obadiah? And he's what? He is a descendant of Esau. Wake up, people. You got the man fulfilling prophecy and all you want to run around and say, he's a false prophet, he's a false prophet. 
And right now the Vatican's got so much authority. They've been, they've been dragging people in that speak against him and they're under investigation. One man is under investigation in the United States by the terrorist organization because he spoke against Pope Francis. You know, I speak against him because he's fulfilling biblical prophecy. You know, I don't believe in harm to anybody. God, God deals with the Bible says God, God does the judgment. Not, we don't do that. God will do the judgment. All right? His works. He's, but the thing is, he could repent if he wanted to. And it would be my desire that he does. But isn't it interesting? He preaches freedom to the animals. He preaches against abortion. See? Just like I do. But do I not speak about abortion because he does? Do I not speak about mercy for animals? When Jeremiah spoke about mercy to the animals? When Isaiah spoke about it? When David spoke about it? When Hosea spoke about it? When Malachi spoke about it? When Yeshua himself in your own gospel says, if you knew what this meant, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, then you would have not have convicted the innocent with the guilty. In the Hebrew Matthew, he says, you would have not have bound the innocent. Speaking of the sacrifices being offered on the altar. And by the way, that is in Hebrew plural. Or ma masculine plural. Speaking about the bulls and goats. But nobody wants to get that, do they? But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possession. See, on Mount Zion, same thing that God gave me in the vision. There's a man drinking on my holy mountain. You're to remove him. I, I have no ability to remove anything. But it does say, right here, upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. You know what brings deliverance? It's the preaching of the gospel that brings deliverance. All this violence that, that now the Orthodox community wants to do against the Palestinians and stuff like that. I, I don't support the violence on either side. The true word of God would bring deliverance. The same for the Palestinian people. The true word of God would bring deliverance. Do you not know, my Jewish brethren, that if they would conform and believe, if they would accept the laws of Israel, we are to treat the Palestinians as your brother. Not as some kind of outcast. But then again, he is also to open up and allow the lost tribes of Israel to come and dwell even in among them. This is not dividing the land of Israel, which is of the devil. And all the different groups that want to do it. You know, they say on the 15th of September that the United Nations is coming together to divide, to officially give a declaration of dividing Israel. God will bring judgment upon the United Nations for it and the world. He's going to bring judgment. He's already declared it through Abraham and through many of his prophets as well that he's done that. So anyway, the Pope of Rome has fulfilled this. Now, what else, is, what else has been fulfilled recently? They've also, because why? They're trying to make Jerusalem, not trying, they are making Jerusalem an international city. I showed you picture after picture after picture where they have taken and they have they have been building checkpoints on highway one coming up into Jerusalem oh they're going to show it to you eventually but they didn't want me to reveal it they don't want me to reveal uh, they don't want me to reveal to you that they're doing this because why they want to do it in their own season to show oh by the way we have now got to deal with the Palestinians and the Israelis to bring about an international internationalized Jerusalem exactly what Shimon Perez the son of Ahab has done he fulfilled prophecy when God said I will not bring upon Ahab to Elijah he said I won't bring upon these evils upon uh, Ahab because he has repent before me in sackcloth and ashes he tell, tells this to Elijah he said but I will bring it upon his son and that is Shimon Perez. Why? Because Shimon Perez brought idolatry back in Israel when you brought the Vatican back in there and you built up all these altars in Baal. God himself will bring them down. You don't think he will? 
God will take an earthquake and open up the earth and swallow every one of these altars to Baals down. You, 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 you brethren over there in Israel, the Orthodox community that, are, that, that, that made the comment they should be burned. No, you got to worry about burning them. You know, God, God will open up the earth Himself. He'll bring a mighty earthquake and bring them all down. He knows, God knows how to shake the earth and cause them to fall and, 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 and His people will stand. You ain't got to do anything. Let God deal with it. In Micah chapter 4 verse 6 says, In that day saith the Lord, will, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. And I will make her that halteth a, a, a remnant, and her that was cast afar off a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forevermore. Now, by the way, this is also going to be dealing with the house of Israel. We'll go into that in just a little bit. But I first wanted you to see, Israel has to come home. Zechariah chapter 12 clearly shows you that Israel comes home. All right? He says, And thou, tower, the flock of the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, and to thee shall it come, even to the first dominion, and the king, king, kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Then he says, Now why dost thou cry out aloud? By the way, the house of Israel is not home yet. Is there no king in thee? You know, Israel, you, you guys in Israel should be waking up to this. You know, Mike Evans, he anointed Benjamin Netanyahu to be the prime minister of Israel, not once but twice. He basically anointed him to be king. When a man of God anoints somebody to be a ruler of the people, they're anointed to be king. It was symbolic. But see, God knew that your king would not deliver you. And the prophecy was right there staring you in the face and you don't even get it. See, he says there, is there no king in thee? Why? Because he's not delivering you. Uh, it was Guglielmo Miotti put out an article not too long ago on Israel National News talking about Jews will be evicted from Jerusalem. And that's exactly what the prophet Micah prophesied will happen. I'll read it to you in just a second. And they've already started doing it. Netanyahu's trying to pretend like to be a good king, and he gives a permit to approve 300 more houses, but he didn't do nothing to stop the ones that got destroyed in East Jerusalem. Or northern Jerusalem, that is. I believe, I believe that that's where Judea and Samaria is north of Jerusalem there. He says, is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perish? He's pointing you right to the prophecy of the Messiah. Daniel said he'd be cut off. At the, after the 69th week, he'll be cut off. But when did he get cut off? In the midst of the week. That's actually written in the Essene Humane Gospel as well. He'd be cut off in the midst of the week. He says... For pains have taken thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city. There's your prophecy. It's being fulfilled. And it's not over with yet. They're going to declare a Palestinian state at this September 15th meeting. Then you're going to see more Jews uprooted out of different parts of Jerusalem. And they're going to be forced to dwell in the fields as the prophet Micah has already declared to you. says, Thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon, there shalt thou be delivered. Babylon? That's Rome. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. That's Esau. He's going to deliver you from them. You know, you wanted Yeshua to deliver you from the hand of the Romans 2,000 years ago. And when it didn't happen, you figured, well, the scripture wasn't fulfilled. But notice, Yeshua read Isaiah, Yeshayahu. He read Isaiah 61, half of verse 2, all of verse 1, closed the, the scroll and said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled. When he talks about bringing the recompense upon your enemies in the second half of verse 2, he doesn't speak of that part. That was for his second coming, which is about to be fulfilled. Anyway, he says you'll be redeemed. Now also many nations are gathered against thee. They are. That say, let her be defiled and let her, let her eye look upon uh, Zion. 
But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel, for he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. And it says, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Now, in order for the prophecy that's coming about now, and there's some that have said that Zerubbabel in Zechariah, when it speaks about the two anointed, the two anointed ones, it's believed that in order for this to be fulfilled, the two witnesses have to come to help gather the lost tribes back home. That may very well be so. I haven't had a chance to really go into all that yet. But we see the article now that they're already talking about bringing home the lost tribes of Israel. Finally. Let me just remind you of what the prophecy says here. Hosea chapter 5 verse 5 says, And the pride of Israel doth testify to his face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Judah also shall fall with them. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. That's chapter 6, verse 1, going into verse 2 now. After two days will he revive us. That's the house of Judah. In the third day he will raise us up. That's the house of Israel. And he and we shall live in his sight. That's both houses. That's not two or three natural days, by the way. That is a thousand years one day with the Lord. Remember that scripture? It's been a little over 2,000 years since Israel was dispersed as a nation. Or right at 2,000 years. They've come home. It's been like 2,800 years since the house of Israel was dispersed. Now they're talking about bringing them home. In the third day, I'll revive them. See? Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning. He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Now, in Zechariah chapter 8, I want to read this to you. And it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, as I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, said the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. So again, I have thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Fear ye not. These are things that you shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor and love no false oath. For all these things that I hate, saith the Lord. He doesn't want you burnt sacrifices of your red heifer. Isaiah 66 says, if you kill an ox, it's if you killed a man. Don't make the same mistake. Jeremiah clearly tells you not to do that. Isaiah spoke against it. So does Hosea. So did Malachi. Let's drop back to, to, to Hosea again so you can see this. Hosea chapter 6 verse 4. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is a morning cloud as the early dew it goeth away. In other words, you don't act good very long. Therefore have I hewed thee by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. For I desired mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Do you know that the rain that goes forth is in Hebrew it says a mora geshem. It's a teaching rain. He wants you to be taught. Not burning. Not killing. But they like men have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. How did you transgress the covenant? By the sacrifices. Jeremiah says that God never, he never commanded your fathers to do this. You did it of your own accord. Oh, you know, I've got those that have written me and they've said to me, they said, well, Brother Steve, you know, God was the first one to ever offer a sacrifice. Really? And you take it from Genesis where he said he put skins on Adam and Eve. Really? And you assume that that was animal skins and God killed an animal. Well, to correct on that, this happens to apply to both human and animal skins, both. But if you'd like to know the truth of the matter, no, God never killed any animal. But you have to remember, Adam and Eve were clothed in light to begin with. 
when they were in the Garden of Eden. When he brought them to this earth, the book of Adam and Eve said he clothed them in skins and then they, Adam and Eve were looking at their body and they didn't understand it. And God went on to let them know, I gave you this skin so that you could deal with the climate of this earth. So when they were in the Garden of Eden, although they were made from the form from the dust to the ground, there was something altogether different from that of what we have in this earthly realm here. So no doubt they had a body because it's what God says, but it also says they were clothed in His glory, His light. So no, God didn't have to kill an animal to clothe them. Now later we do know that the fig leaves, we read about how that they ended up with, um, somewhere along the way, somebody says an animal skin. Now according to the book of Adam and Eve, we find out that a lion had killed a, a lamb, and God did put that skin on them later when they lost their fig leaves. So a lot of things are attributed to God that he never did. And people are just not aware of these things. And then, of course, there's people that say, well, it was, did not Abel offer up unto God his lamb? Do you know there was one canon of the Bible that used to be part of the canon that they took out? And the story in there says it the other way around. Now that's up to you whether you want to believe that or not. But there are three books, ancient documents, that are biblical books, that are no longer part of your canon, two of which were part of your canon at one time. In both of those books, it tells the story the other way around. It was actually Abel that offered up the fruit, the pure oblation. And it was Abel that slaughtered and killed the lamb. Now that's interesting in itself. That's up to you on however you want to choose to do with that. But I think we should look at this a little bit deeper and see what does the Word of God say. By the way, they say that the book uh, of the Dead Sea Scrolls is almost like the Masoretic text. No, it's not. The, the, the scroll of Isaiah alone has over oh, 2,600 differences compared to the Isaiah scroll that we have in the Masoretic text. They just want you to believe the Masoretic text. Anyway, let's continue on. In Jeremiah 31, verse 31, says, Behold, the days come and saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Interesting. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall, know, shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will, give their, uh, excuse me, I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. Same as Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. When God no longer remembers their iniquity or their sins. So when the house of Israel comes home, it's also the time that their eyes come open. Now, at the same time as all these things are coming forth, you know what's going to cause the Jews to go along with this propaganda that the Vatican is perpetrating to bring about this international city? They're going to allow a third temple to be built. Why do you think they're all getting ready and all the excitement is happening with the Temple Institute? Raising the red heifers, raising money for the temple, all these things. That's how the Vatican makes the compromise. And by the way, I was there requesting an interview with the rabbi of right there on uh, at uh, the tomb of David. They were afraid to speak to me. You know why? Because the Pope of Rome now, of course, he has an official seat there at the, at the tomb of David, which makes him the king of Israel, by the way. Put a seat at the tomb of David for the Pope of Rome makes him the king of Israel. And so they wouldn't do an interview with me because they were afraid. 
because the Pope of Rome was given Mount Zion, or the Vatican, anyway, was given Mount Zion. A lot of things happening, friends. A lot of things are happening. At any rate, that's uh, some more things I want to bring to your attention here. Let me get my notes in order. Your two witnesses are definitely coming on the scene. I believe that they're already here. And the reason I say that is because when we look at the scripture, John the Baptist came forth in the power of Elijah. The scripture bears that record of him. It speaks about that the spirit of Elijah would rest upon Elisha. Also, we find that with Moses even, God told Moses that Joshua would be a prophet in his room. In other words, take his place. And that was the same wording that God used with Elisha to Elijah. He said, he will be a prophet in your room. So clearly God is, it's not a reincarnation or anything like that. I do not believe in reincarnation. And by the way, there's some that have also written that it seems to believe in reincarnation. You have to remember, there's more than one book on the Essene Gospel. One group did, the other did not. It's the same thing with the birth. One believes in the virgin birth, the other did not believe in the virgin birth. So the point is, is you cannot ascribe different doctrines based on what you think when you look on the internet. Go and read it for yourself. And when we're finished uh, making the, on the scene, humane gospel of Jesus or Yeshua, once we're finished with all of the scholastic research that ties it together to all the, all, it ties it with our own Bible. And by the way, Paul quotes this book so many times it's not even funny. And you're going to hear that in just a few minutes. One of his quotes from the Essene Humane Gospel. But he quotes it numerous times. You just didn't know it. But we're also tying it in with other books as well, like Enoch as our Bible also quotes Enoch as well. So did Yeshua from the Essene Human Gospel. He quoted Enoch when it come to the calendar. Okay, so Revelation 11, 1 says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God in the altar, and them that worship therein. That was another prophecy that just got fulfilled, because why? The Temple Institute put out a video saying that they have the plans prepared for the third temple now. And the angel said, yeah, he was given a reed like unto a rod, a measuring stick. How does a guy draw the temple plans? But with a ruler. That's the way they do it. I know today they do it on computers and all that kind of good stuff, but you understand what I'm saying. It's giving you the type of terminology. It says, but the court which is without the temple, leave it out, measure it not, for it's given unto the Gentiles. They shall tread the holy city underfoot forty and two months, three and a half years. Isn't that interesting? Three and a half years. Well, <laughs> it's how long the two witnesses speak, by the way. By the way, keep in mind, the Essene community of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is debate whether or not it was an Essene community, but there's enough evidence to support that it was. But we'll say like this, the Dead Sea Scroll community, the Zedekite priests that were there, also believed in a 364 day a year calendar according to the Book of Enoch. Interesting, isn't it? I used to always think that the three and a half years that the two witnesses would preach, that it would be first, and then the second half, that's when God would fulfill the rest of the prophecy according to Daniel 7, until God revealed to me recently, and it was also shown to me in the Essene Gospels there, that Yeshua fulfilled half of that week already when he was killed. So there's still half of the week left, which is fulfilled in Revelation chapter 11. But when I read this here, and I see that the two witnesses prophesy uh, on here exactly three and a half years according to a lunar calendar, I thought, well, surely then it must be that they come first, then the other half. But it's not that way. Because what is it? When their prophecy ends, there's enough time for what? Their dead bodies lay in the street three and a half days. Basically, you can say four days because of the fact they're already in the fourth day. And then... Because you've got to remember, if you got four days more than a lunar calendar over a three-year period, that's 12 days, and the half a year would be like, what, 15 and a half, 16 days, correct? Well, take away four of those days, 
And then guess what do you have left? You have, we'll say, maximum 12 days. According to the Apocalypse of Abraham in chapter 30, 10 of those days are when the uh, plagues are poured out on the earth. The judgments that will come against man. It's in more than one book besides the, the Apocalypse of Abraham. There's another book that speaks of it. We also see it in the book of Revelation. A little bit different type of account. But there's 10 days there. And then Abraham goes on to speak about how that uh, then the angels come after that. And they gather up for that next day or so. That completes your full spectrum of three and a half years according to the Dead Sea Scroll calendar which I thought was kind of interesting, perfectly lining up. And it appears to be, even from all the scriptures that we have seen, that there definitely is a rapture, even in the Essene Humane Scroll, there is a rapture. That rapture comes right before the wrath of Almighty God is poured out. Perfectly in line with the scriptures that we have. But the wrath of Almighty God is poured out after the resurrection of his two witnesses. So what do they do here? It says that the, the court is given to the Gentiles. That is, of course, the Vatican. And the Palestinians, no doubt. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. That's three and a half years according to a lunar calendar. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth, which is in Zechariah's prophecy. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. Not like they're dragons, but whatever they say, God will honor their words. Verse 6, These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over the waters to turn them to blood. And to smite the earth with all with plagues as often as they will, just like Aaron, Moses and Aaron, as well as Elijah calling fire down that destroyed uh, the soldiers. And notice, it wasn't that he had fire coming out of his mouth either. He just said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. That's the way it'll happen. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that sinneth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them, and their dead bodies shall be in the street, the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified, right near the Palestinian bus station outside Damascus Gate there. Their dead bodies lay three and a half days. Now, there's something that I really wanted to share with you as well. Um, And we're going to do this last part here in closing. You want to get a taste of what type of ministry they're going to bring? I want to give you the exact type of ministry that they're going to bring you. If you're faint of heart, you may not want to listen to this. This is from the Essene Humane Gospel. It's in chapter 55. Let me, before I do that one, I'm going to do for you verse uh, chapter 59. And, and by the way, this is in our own Bible. You'll see that it was taken from this book here. It's just some of the things were omitted. Because you've got to remember, Constantine put our Bible together. Along with some of the Christians, like Eusebius, the early church fathers. This says here, it's in chapter 59, verse 2, says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto a white of tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of the dead and all uncleanliness. Does that sound familiar to you? Let me, let me pull that up. And I'm going to show you something they didn't want to tell you. In the book of um, Matthew 23, 27, I believe it is. Yes. It says here, 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto the whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Do you know that the word men's was added? Look at your own Bible. If you have a King James Bible, it's in italics. Is that right? It's not there. So literally it says, Woe well, unto you, fire, scribes and Pharisees, for you are like unto white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but are within full of dead, dead bones and all uncleanliness. Isn't that interesting? And the Greek word here is the grave, of course, for the word sepulchre. And uh, and the word for the dead in Greek is it's a corpse, a dead something. It's just something that's dead. It doesn't really specify if it's man or not. That's that's something you know. So interesting how things can be altered. See, and then they don't want you they because they don't really want you to know. But it's the same thing. But here, Yeshua actually says you're full of the dead. In Matthew 23, 23 27, he said you're full of, the, of dead bones. Now, it's easy for us to assume, because he's typing it to a sepulcher, that it's dead men's bones. But let me read to you what he says here, and then maybe it'll help you to understand. Again, from chapter 59 of the Seeing Humane Gospel of Jesus, it says, uh, For you are like unto white tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead and, uncle and uncleanliness. Even so, you also outwardly appear as shining temples, as the righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and dead things. Well, he goes on to say similar to that also in Matthew 23, 28. He says, even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Do you know in the Hebrew, Matthew, he says you're filled with the dead and in iniquity. Interesting, isn't it? So, why did our scripture get altered? Well, it's really there. It's just a little bit twisted enough to where you can't understand what he's talking about. Yeshua goes on to say here though, for ye are yourselves living tombs of the dead rather than temples of the living God, whom you know not. They didn't put that in there at all, did they? Did they do they? Do you know in the Apocalypse of Abraham, he states in one of the plagues that comes on the people, he states on there, hang on, I got it here somewhere in my notes. Here it is. It's in chapter 30, it's in verse 12. Wild animals, this is one of the judgments that comes on the earth. Wild animals shall be their graves. Isn't that interesting? We also see in, in, in Scripture, also I believe it's in the book of Revelation, where the animals in the latter days will turn on the people. Do you know that one of the plagues that when Moses and Aaron put the plague on Egypt, do you know one of those plagues that, that, that Egypt was invaded with the wild beast? The wild animals of every sort. They came in there and ravaged the people. We see that in the book of Exodus, but you don't get to see the full picture of it unless you read the book of Jasher, which, by the way, is quoted in the book of Joshua. So those that think, oh, that's another one of those books that are not canonized. Well, Joshua actually quotes the book of Jasher. And it's also quoted in another book in the Bible as well. And tells you to go to the book of Jasher in order to find out these things. So we go on and we read here. Won't you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the sepulchers of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we surely would not have been partakers of them in the blood of the prophets. You would think I'm reading right out of the book of Matthew, wouldn't you? 
It's right out of the scene, humane gospel. He says, liars, wherefore you be witness unto yourselves that you do as the children of them which did kill the prophets. Wherefore it was said by the holy wisdom herself, behold, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them shall you scourge and kill and crucify. Wisdom, by the way, is the Holy Spirit. Some people might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, herself, do you know that wisdom in the book of Proverbs is referred to as a she? Didn't know that, did you? Wherefore it's said by the, uh, excuse me, um, kill and crucify and persecute, and upon you shall come all the righteous bloodshed upon the earth, the blood of righteous Abel, and to the blood of Zacharias. And by the way, I've done a lot of research on the blood of Zacharias. That was John's father. And in the Essene Humane Gospel, it speaks about how he was killed between the gate and the altar. He offered incense in the temple, but he refused to be a part of the blood sacrifices. And when he refused to divulge where his son had went to, where his mother had taken him to hide him in the wilderness away from the priest, they killed Zacharias. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou wicked city that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee in truth, and how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gather her chicks under her wings, but you would not give ear. Again, it sounds like we're reading right out of uh, Matthew, doesn't it? I want you to hear, though, how he words this here when he sits on the temple, or when he sits, was on the, according to what we read, he was on the Mount of Olives when he says this, but according to this here, I believe he's in another place here because he's talking to the Pharisees. He says here in verse 6, chapter 59, Behold thy hearts of stone, for now thy house is left desolate unto you. Remember when I taught you not long ago, I said that that house that's left desolate is not the physical house, but it represented the human heart. I taught that because the Spirit of God put it in my heart that the house was not speaking of the temple itself, although you could look at it as a twofold purpose. But I knew that it spoke of the human heart. And right here, Yeshua confirmed it in the Essene Humane Gospel, chapter 59, verse 6. Behold thy hearts of stone, for now thy house is left desolate unto you. The, how, the human heart. For I say unto you truly, ye shall not see me henceforth till you should cry out, Holy, 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 blessed are they who come in the name of the just one. He's speaking of the two witnesses. I didn't know that. We have holy, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And we assume that that's speaking of Yeshua's second coming. But you have to remember, when Yeshua comes a second time, he destroys everything. The way Israel is going to recognize that Yeshua is the Messiah is through the two witnesses. The way the bride of Christ, the Gentile bride, is going to get in herself in line and in order is going to be through the two witnesses. Why does the scripture in our own canon say that you will take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, we have heard that the Lord is with you. Ten people of the nations will say, we have heard the Lord is with you. Come and tell us your ways. He's not talking about 613 Talmudic traditions. You know, God said that you should bind these laws upon your, on your doorpost, upon your bedpost, upon your hand, between your eyes. You can't bind 613 of them there. They won't fit. This is where it's going to get hard for you. Because this is what your two witnesses are going to speak. And we'll close it after I read this here. And by the way, I'll, I'll post this on here for you so you can see. Because this part here, I'd already done the research to, 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 to be able to actually tie it in for you. So to give you an example of this. This is in chapter 55. Um, starting with verse 1, we're going to verse 8. I think that's right. Yeah, to verse 8. It says, And it came to pass that some of uh, Yeshua's disciples who were stonemasons were repairing one of the chambers of the temple in Jerusalem. And Yeshua was passing by, and they said unto him, Lord and Master, do you see these great buildings, and what manner of stones are set here? 
And Yeshua answered, Yea, the stonework is indeed great and beautiful, for well wrought are the stones. But I tell you, the days comes when not one stone should be left on another. Again, like reading in our own Bible. For the true temple is the body of man in which the true God dwelleth by the Spirit. Wow. That sounds like something Paul would say, doesn't it? In a moment, you're going to see a direct quote that Paul made that was from the Essene Humane Gospel. He says, For I say unto you, when this temple is destroyed in three days, God shall raise up a more glorious temple, which the eyes of the natural man perceives not. Know you not that ye are the living temples of the Holy Spirit, and whose, whoso destroys one of these temples, the same shall be himself destroyed. We didn't get that in our gospel, did we? We didn't see that ourselves. But do you know Paul quotes this? In 1 Corinthians 3.17, Paul actually is quoting Yeshua. He says here in 1 Corinthians 3.17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. What did Jesus say here? Know you not that you are the living temples of the Holy Spirit? And whoso destroys one of these temples, the same shall be himself destroyed. Amazing. Let's read on. And some of the scribes, verse 4, and Pharisees who rendered flesh and blood rituals at the temple heard Yeshua's words and sought to entangle him in his talk and said, If you would put away the sacrifice of sheep and oxen and birds, to what purpose was the temple built for? Excuse me, what purpose was the temple for God built God by Solomon? Built for God by Solomon. And Yeshua said unto them, It is written in the prophets, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, for the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. You'll find that in Matthew 21, 13. But you know not the pure oblation, nor do you wish to know, for you have it a house of slaughter and bloodshed, a house filled with, my, with, with many evils. Again, he, he says, verse 6, I say unto thee, it is written from the rising of the sun and to the setting of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and incense with a pure offering shall be offered unto me. That's quoted from Malachi chapter 1, verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and every place incense shall be offered unto my name in pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen or the Gentiles, saith the Lord of hosts. But you have made it, Yeshua continues on, but you have made it a desolation with your flesh and blood offerings and used the sweet incense only to cover the ill savor thereof or the ill smell thereof. Know you, I am not come to destroy the law. We find that in Matthew 5, 17, but to interpret and fulfill all things spoken of me. Know you not what is written? Obedience is better than sacrifice, and to hearken better than the fat of rams. I, the Lord, am weary of your burnt offerings and vain oblation. Your hands are full of blood. It was taken from 1 Samuel 15, 22, is where Yeshua was quoting from, where it says here, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than that of the fat of rams. Verse 8. Yeshua says, and it is not also written, what is the sacrifice? Wash you and make you clean and put away you the evil from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well. Yea, do justice for the fatherless and the widow and all that are oppressed. For by doing so, you shall fulfill the law. We find this in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, where it says, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, please for the widow. Plead for the widow, excuse me. And Yeshua continued, Pure worshipers worship the eternal spirit in purity and in truth. Ye are the temple. It says in our own Matthew, he said to the Pharisees, you're full of dead men's bones. And he says, Yeshua says, quoting, even like Paul says in 1 Corinthians, those that destroy the temple, God will also destroy. I used to hear this a lot when I was younger, and they'd say, if you smoke and drink and stuff like that, you're defiling the temple of God because your body is a temple of God. And I'd think, oh, okay, all right, I, I can believe that, so I never smoked or drank growing up. 
He doesn't want the dead in your body either. Because what did Yeshua say there? What was one of the things that he says? Know you not that you are the living temples of the Holy Spirit? Who so destroys one of these temples, the same shall be himself destroyed. Let me back up. That's verse 3. For the true temple is the body of man in which the true God dwelleth by the Spirit. For I say unto you, when this temple is destroyed in three days, God shall raise up a more glorious temple which the eye of the natural man perceives not. Know you not that you are the living temples of the Holy Spirit. So many of you have quoted that to me over and over and over and over. When I speak about the temple being built in Jerusalem, I've always known that. I've always believed that. But you're not to be defiling your temple. And as you saw already, they defiled it with dead things. Consider the things that I'm telling you. Your two witnesses are coming. I don't have to say a word. But they're going to be hated by the world. Somebody told me recently, they said, Steve, in a, in a, in a, mess, a quote on one of the messages there, they said, if the two witnesses are being hated by the world, then the bride must already be gone. Well, no. It says in Revelation, the remnant, the rest of the remnant, after they rose up, were frightened and gave glory unto God. There's going to be some that will believe those two witnesses. But when it says the world will hate them, the world order, by the way, cosmos in the Greek language, it's the world order. The new world order is going to hate them. But Pope Francis is planning on making sure you get a gospel very similar to what they're going to believe. There's another one of the non-canonical books that says that they will do all kinds of miracles. But the one thing they won't be able to do is raise the dead because there's no life in them. That's what it says. I can't say one way or the other on that. I do know God is going to bring some incredible miracles with His two witnesses. They're here somewhere. And they soon will end up coming on the scene. They're going on the 15th of September. They're going to do, and they're going to split officially Israel. Somewhere in here, these two witnesses must come on the scene to awaken Israel. And I know even my Christian brothers and sisters that may not understand this part when I speak about meat and things like that. And, you know, and I realize you're a free moral agent. You have a right to do whatever you feel on your heart. You can do that. That's up to you. Choose life, though. The more excellent way. We're going to be doing this in the millennium anyway, friends. Nothing shall hurt nor destroy. I've told you about in Noah, you know, or excuse me, in the book of Genesis, where Noah, God made a covenant, not just with Noah and his sons, with the animals as well. And then he commanded them, not the way the Jews have perverted it. My brothers have perverted it. He commanded them, don't eat flesh that has blood. In other words, don't eat anything that has a soul. Yes, animals have a soul. That's what it says in Hebrew. They were given nefesh chai. They were living souls. Think about it. I'm trying to get you prepared for what's about to come. It's not going to be a, a rose bed of ease. I thank so many of you for writing me. Many left. Many took away their support because we believe in a humane gospel the way Yeshua taught it. We believe in a humane gospel. But many have left because of that. But I refuse to back down from preaching the truth. And there's been many of you that have also stood with us and you have made it clear, over 500 likes on that one video, you made it clear that you stood with us. Even in your support, you made it clear. We thank you for doing that. Especially in an hour that we're living in now. And by the way, I want to just share with you one thing else too, in closing. I know it's a little bit off the subject, but I, it's something that bothers me so bad. You know how when people go to McDonald's and get chicken nuggets, 
The other day, my wife shared with me a video. I'm going to share it with you here now as well. The way these are made is in a house when they're, when they're separating chickens, do you know that male chickens at a hatchery are not kept alive, only the females, because they can produce eggs. And they show how they're separating them on a conveyor belt. And they don't care if they fall off and die, it doesn't matter. Females are saved alive, but the males, once they're separated out, they pick up one by one, looking to see which one's male, which one's female. And then all of a sudden you see in this film, that was filmed secretly, these males, drop into a grinder alive, little male baby chicks. You know, it's funny, the government in the United States, if you do any kind of cruelty to a dog or cat, they can arrest you and prosecute you for that, and they should. But the cruelty and the inhumaneness that is done to, the, to animals, such as chickens, cows, pigs, everything else, they do it, and the government knows it. Could you imagine what the government would do to you if you ground a cat alive? These little chicks are dropped into that grinder, alive. No humaneness at all. And it separates everything. What have we become? If Yeshua, when he took, in our own canon, he took according to the book of John. By the way, the book of John, that's the gospel of John, is the most accurate gospel we have. It actually is so much like the Essene Humane Gospel, it's not even funny. I'm surprised they let it in there. But John actually is the only one that recorded that when Jesus beat the money changers in the temple, he's the only one that had the nerve and the guts to report that he freed the animals as well. If there's any way you can save an animal, save one. My wife said if we had the finances, we'd go buy a farm. We don't. We just live from week to week like many of you do. But if we had the money to do it, we would buy some big place, and we would rescue as many of these animals as we could. We love you guys, and thank you for standing with us. Shalom.